Good morning, everybody, wherever you are. Um, we know that uh, we'll have some of our international colleagues who will be staying up late in their different jurisdictions. We'll be keeping at least one of our international colleagues, possibly from his dinner and maybe a sweet Tennessee, or sorry, do I say Tennessee, I meant Kentucky bourbon. Um, and that'd be Mike Hines, who you can see there on the screen. Um, and to the Haven Home Safe staff who'll be dialing in from the various locations and anyone else. It's either good morning, good afternoon or good evening. And hopefully it's not good, very, very early morning for anyone. So I'd like to introduce you folks to my friend and colleague, uh, the, I was gonna say the word legendary, but I'm not even sure that captures it. But anyway, the, the very accomplished Mike Hines, who's the CEO of Winterwood Housing in based in Kentucky, although they work across five states in the United States of America. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about Winterwood and a little bit about Mike, mainly so I can embarrass him just a fraction before we maybe throw him off guard a bit before we throw some questions at him. But the first thing I guess is that uh, Winterwood is a property management company with a very diversified real estate portfolio. So this is very different from Australian type housing associations. It's been around for about 42 years. The company uh, is, it's a whole, whole of enterprise, vertically integrated company. They're into asset management, real estate development, property acquisitions, construction management, the whole box and dice. And it's all about providing services to the clients of the company as you'd appreciate. So Mike's the chief executive officer. He's responsible for oversight of all the entire activities of the corporation, which includes real estate development, financing, construction oversight, asset management, which is a, a real, one of Mike's many strengths, and obviously the, and the administration of some of their supportive programs. Um, I first met Mike when he was the chief exec of uh, Housing Partnership uh, based in Kentucky, and he's been now with Winterwood for a couple of years. Mike uh, started with Housing Partnership in 2003, I think it was, as an asset manager, Mike. and yes, for yeah, progressed through the company to become their chief executive. Um, Mike's well known. He's a well known speaker at all sorts of conferences in anything pretty much to do with property development, property industry uh, in various parts of the United States. And he is so well qualified. It's just ridiculous, frankly. How can you fit all that in that I've described and still have all these qualifications? Mike obviously started university when he was three years old. Um, <laughs> so he's a certified public accountant. He's a, a certified commercial investment member, a licensed broker in the state of Kentucky, and he holds a master's in strategic finance, which is really unusual and a very powerful qualification for the kind of industries that we're in. Uh, Mike is, uh, serves as the, the president of the Kentucky Affordable Housing Coalition. Um, he is married, he has two children, and he currently resides in, and correct me if I get this wrong, Mike, Louisville. Which, very good. Did I do okay with that? That's very good, yes. I've been, I've been practicing, right? Yeah, good. <laughs> so, very good. <laughs> so Mike is um, one of Haven Home Safe's uh, thinkers in residence. We've had a small number of people who we've embedded in our organization for a, a week or so, uh, so that they can kind of lift up every folder, peer under every rock, have a look at some of the ways we do things and then give us the benefit of their, their observation, their advice and their wisdom, which is another way for us saying we steal their good ideas. Um, and so Mike was our thinker in residence and I think it was 2017, Mike. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Mike particularly looked at our asset management operations and a, and, and a range of uh, operations related to that. And that really sparked us and sent us down a journey to become certified uh, under the ISO, the International Standards Organization, and since that time, we have become the first housing association in Australia to be ISO certified for asset management and maintenance, but also the first housing association in the world. And so, you know, success has many parents and uh, Mike, you can take a piece of that as well. So thanks for that. Um, so Mike, Winterwood, it's a women's owned business enterprise. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so, so we are owned, uh, we have two primary shareholders. Um, our principal, um, Carol Warshin, she's been involved with the business in the 40 years uh, this summer. And we have, uh, she owns the majority of the business. And then we have a minority shareholder as well. 
uh, a woman by the name of Gail Williams, and she, uh, she's she been involved with the business since its founding. Uh, and uh, been around a total of 44 years. Uh, Carol's involvement is 42 years. Uh, so Carol's been there from just about the very beginning. So, so, so Mike, the, uh, you know, I'm reminded of something I read in, in uh, a journal just in the last couple of days. They're saying that uh, boards of organizations that have women on them tend to react quicker and more comprehensively to things like COVID-19, um, which is, you know, really interesting to note. So this, the, the notion of women's business enterprise, I think, is, is fascinating. And because your two principles have been around for so long, does, does that influence does that influence the particular style of operation you've got? I mean, I know that you, you run recovery centers, uh, domestic assault centers, I think you call them. And you also do some some housing for what you call medically vulnerable individuals. So can you shed some light on some of that for us? Certainly. So we, we have a, a real compassionate business model as relates to working with specialized populations. Um, our footprint uh, encompasses about 250 properties across a little more than 10,000 units across the portfolio. And a significant share of those uh, is specialized housing. So that is domestic assault shelters, that is recovery centers, which have been an issue here in the States for some time now when we manage and oversee those centers. Uh, the medically vulnerable in individuals, that's a fairly new initiative we've begun working on the last couple of years uh, to try to house some of our most medically vulnerable uh, citizens uh, in a safe, secure environment with services. Uh, so it's service-enriched housing uh, that that also provides safe, affordable shelter. So that's uh, we are. That is actually one of our uh, initiatives for this year, uh, which we hope to continue to to execute on. We have every plan to do so. Uh, so we are uh, pushing forward with that as we speak. That's a really interesting business model, Mike, because you you know you you're right in that development space. One of the things that that struck me about Winterwood is is not only the consistency of the retention rate of your properties. You know, in America, properties, depending on how they're owned, can often be lost to the field. They can be lost to the, to the sector, and you guys have a ninety percent retention rate, which is extraordinarily high. I understand. Um, the other thing, of course, is uh, in your regulatory framework, you guys also have above 90% of um, above average ratings by your government regulators, which again, outstanding work. Um, and your occupancy rate over 95% consistently. This is, this is very good uh, in, in any international standard, I think. But the thing that really struck me, Mike, is that you guys have been rated as the best place to work in Kentucky for, is it now six years in a row? Six years running. That's right, Ken. Yeah. So, so when you took over, Mike, it didn't collapse. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck with 2020. I imagine that's a hell of a record. So, Mike, it, it's it's obviously an extraordinary company. Um, just, and I think it's really, you know, for the people here in Australia, where we have essentially a fairly vanilla flavoured style of housing association. And, and Haven Home Safe is very unusual in that we are a homelessness outfit as well as a housing association and wherever possible, try and to tie those two things together. So when you talk about a, a service enhanced environment, here we'd be calling that a support, uh, a supported environment or support programs that, that come in and out of the buildings. And, and I guess the number of buildings compared to the number of homes is again a distinction. In Australia, we tend to have single single occupancy dwellings or small townhouse developments. Rarely do we have uh, very large, multiple dwelling, single buildings. So many, many differences, but a lot, a lot is the same too. But Mike, the, the topic of the day, life under lockdown, what's COVID-19 doing? I understand you got a new governor about 12 months or so ago, and, I, and I'm hearing he's doing great work there in Kentucky, but what's it, what, how does this play out as the CEO of Winterwood? trying to manage across not only Kentucky, but those other states as well. Well, first of all, Ken, let me congratulate you on your ISO the standard achievement. That is uh, something to be very proud of. And uh, let me also say that uh, my time with your organization in 2017, I, I carried very many lessons from that, that I have brought forward and utilized in various ways, uh, replicated and duplicated in many ways. 
and uh, and I really appreciated that opportunity. So let me just start there. Uh, yes, our governor, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, and I may be selfish, uh, has been uh, a national leader in my view in dealing with this crisis. Uh, Kentucky is a, a state of about 4.4 million people. Um, as of May 13th, because you know these statistics grow stale, uh, we've had about 7,000 cases confirmed. Uh, we've completed about 117,000 tests statewide. Uh, we have had 326 deaths unfortunately, uh, and 26, 2,600 people have uh, recovered thus far. Uh, our governor acted very quickly. Uh, our first case occurred that we know of, uh, March 6th was our first confirmed case. By March 13th, we were implementing lockdown measures uh, within the state, uh, and they increased from there. Um, it was the Saturday, I, think, I believe that's the Saturday before St. Patrick's Day, uh, that we actually we actually locked down at that time. So there's a very little lag between our first positive indication and immediate measures taken by our state governor uh, to to get it under control. Um, the um, the organization, um, and, and in fact, I went back and looked this up. We had our first emergency meeting same day, March 13th. Uh, I had just come myself from a conference uh, out of state came back the Thursday before, that was a Friday, Friday the 13th, oddly enough, came back to, to that Friday the 13th, and we immediately began emergency meetings uh, and emergency procedures within my organization, not only to respond to the governor's directives, but also to start to prepare for what we thought was coming. Yeah, it's interesting. I, mean, I think there's a lot of similarities there. We're, we're here in Victoria, in Australia, um, we're very fortunate that our, our Premier, who's just referred to now as Premier Dan, um, is uh has taken national leadership as well and we're very very fortunate i think that uh in the states because of the the, the unique nature of our constitution is that the states have prominence in some of these areas and so they have in fact been able to lead our federal government notwithstanding our federal government did shut down international tra travel to china in mid-february and so pretty much by the end of february the start of march you know everybody we know was head down into you know uh, what was coming what was obviously coming and um and so we too like you we kicked off our business continuity management team meeting at the, the start of that second i think uh week in march so yeah just that week before saint patrick's day obviously a great loss to both of us mike not being able to celebrate saint <laughs> patrick's day but you know we march on um so the the notion of the the day-to-day -day changes that living under some form of lockdown brings in terms of trying to keep your operation going. What, is, what does that look like in an average day for Winterwood? So, uh, so we, we implemented, uh, so we began to uh, implement, and we, we are deemed an essential business everywhere that we work, which means we have to be available and on call for all of our residents all the time, almost as normal. We began to implement, though, uh, certain protocols uh, around how we would service our, our residents, particularly in the area of maintenance, uh, what types of requests we would accept and deal with, um, how we would uh, process that. Uh, we began to, to send home functions at the corporate office that could be worked from home. Uh, we're fortunate in that um, because of our footprint, because of our scale, uh, property to property, our widest scale is about 600 mile radius, which is about 960 kilometers. So it's a decent footprint. So we, we had a good IT technology infrastructure. Uh, we also communicate regularly with our international overseas folks uh, in Cebu City. So we, we have a very good IT infrastructure. So we were able to really launch a work at home protocol very quickly. Uh, really within a matter of about 48 hours from the time we said go, everybody was home, everybody was up and working. Um, it, was a, it was a bit funny sitting at the corporate office. It was almost like a, a fire sale. Everybody was walking out with their community commuter, computer monitors and their, 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 I think we had a few really nice chairs kind of go out of the office. I mean, people are just, uh, just uh, look at home and, and we've been there since. Um, we are phasing our reopening. We plan to begin to slowly bring people back, uh, probably on the 20th of May. Uh, but uh, there were a certain core group of us that we had to be there. Uh, there's certain functions that just have to be processed in person. 
Yeah. And so there's about 10 of us that had to be there throughout the duration. So. Yeah. So again, many similarities. We, we also, essential business, need to re 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 remain open. The, the challenge, of course, particularly for the homeless elements of our business is how do you remain open but minimize or eliminate face-to-face -face contact? And so we've done that by creating a virtual concierge. You'd recall our concierge model of how we welcome people into our organization and so forth. And so we've gone to a fully digital concierge. So when someone walks in, they see, you know, one of our staff's happy smiling faces on a massive big television monitor saying, hey, thanks for coming in. Sorry, we can't be there to talk to you face to face, but you understand why. And, and then moving, directing people into interview rooms where there's a virtual con consultation. Um, but the same, I think with you guys, you know, we're still running our maintenance operations, although we're essentially only doing uh, urgent and essential work rather than your kind of day to day stuff. Uh, which we can rack and stack. So, uh, and, and in terms of, yeah, the fire sale notion, people wandering out of the building with, you know, with their computer and their monitor on their, on their ergonomic chairs. It's, it's been something to see, I agree entirely. Uh, I'm fortunate that I'm able to work primarily from home, although like you, uh, you know, you touch base with your organisations, you need to be seen out there. And, and certainly I've been to all of our offices except one. And I have warned them, Mike, that I am coming at them and will irritate them. So um, one of the things that, you know, that this transition to moving um, to working from home, it's not just about being able to pick up your monitor and your laptop and your, and your keyboard and, and suddenly plonk it down somewhere at home. You know, there's the work health and safety aspects. But but you've also got 20 staff, and you just mentioned this obliquely on the way through. You've got 20 staff in the Philippines. What do they do for you there in the Philippines, Mike? They allow us to provide basically 24-hour a day processing. The, from, from our time zone, they are almost exactly 12 hours uh, apart. So we are able to process through uh, certainly back office accounting administrative functions on a 24-hour a, a day cycle. And... Largely, that's with accounting functionalities, invoice coding, uh, financial statement uh, coding, things of that nature. We also track and monitor utility consumption on a property by property basis. We track and monitor, uh, for example, uh, you, you spoke about uh, government inspections, government reviews. We track and monitor those due dates and those protocols. Uh, so there's a lot of functionality that we work with with them. Uh, one of the challenges we did have, though, because uh, the connectivity. Uh, internet connectivity there is not as good as it is here. So we had to make special provisions uh, to provide internet connectivity so they could also work from home because they are doing that as well. So. Yeah, um, as you were describing the functions that, have, that you've effectively offshored, I could feel a collective shiver run down the spines of most of my administrative staff. But let's move on, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> So what, what are some of the things that, that you've discovered you miss under this, this COVID-19 arrangement? And, and, and what are some of the things that you think, hmm, maybe I'm not missing that? You know, what are, what are some of your personal observations about this? We're suddenly working from home. I mean, you get to spend more time with Jennifer. That's obviously a bonus. But Lee, apart from that. Well, so I, I, still, I actually go to the office more now than I normally do. So my normal, my normal schedule is about 50 to 60% of my time is in the office. Uh, since we went into crisis mode, um, I have been at the office every day, all day, because decisions are having to be made in real time. <clears throat> I, I, was, I had the benefit of, of listening to the Jim Steele uh, conversation, and uh, we had no benefit of a plan for this whatsoever. So uh, all of the policies and procedures that we are implementing with uh, conflicting guidance coming out day to day, those things have to be processed immediately in real time. Employees have to be instructed how to operate in the field. Uh, it's, it's, been, um, it's been quite quite a lesson in emergency response and how to deal with that uh, from a process standpoint. Um, for me, the biggest thing that I miss is the um, the benefit of walking around, speaking with employees, and the ad hoc conversations that come up from a management basis about decisions that need to be made, which just don't quite make their way into an email or a phone call or another communication. Uh, but if you're in the office and you're interacting and something is, is coming up, you, with a 10-minute conversation, you can knock down five or six topics with an individual staff member at any given time the, the remote communication, you lose that. It, it's not quite the same thing. 
So that I, I have missed that. That is um, something that that I use a lot. Uh, just in, it's called I call it management by walking around, just checking on folks and checking in and answering questions. And that that is something that I miss. I I, I look forward to that coming back. Yeah, I'm, I'm a firm adherent to the NBWA school of thought as well. You know, so that management by walking around, I think, is is critically important, and it and it really is the way that you can stay in touch with what's happening without necessarily referring to reams of reports. You know, whenever doubt, whenever in doubt, just ask someone. Um, you know, it's interesting when we were talking to Geraldine Howley about this, and then also Jim Steele. You know, Jim had. Um, only recently put on what he called a safety officer who had done a lot of work in that work health and safety in preparation for disaster management. In the UK, being the, the kind of regulated environment that the UK is, you know, they've had 40 years of preparing plans for all sorts of things that could go wrong. For us here in Australia, and particularly in regional Australia, you know, the ever-present uh, threat of bushfire and flood um, mm. means that uh, we also are fortunate that we have a lot of this stuff in play. But yeah, so when you describe the requirement to deal with some of that occasionally conflicting advice that's coming out on an ad hoc but often daily basis, I suspect, Mike, that what we saw there was another example of your famous understatement about it being challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> so, Mike, you know, when I was talking to Jim Steele, I was talking about some of the things that I thought we could have, we could have done better in this as, as we've gone along. Um, and I think that will be an evolving thing, uh, you know, as I've said a few times before, you know, it's important never to waste a good crisis. You know, there are always lessons and opportunities there. And I, I think some of the methods that we've adopted to get things done uh, will stay with us. Uh, when I was talking to, uh, to Jim or Geraldine, I was saying, you know, a lot of the window dressing of what we do has fallen away as we focus on the base practitioner stuff that we must do. And, uh, and so I think, you know, there are things that in terms of we could do better, there's some things that I'm really proud of at what we've done. But in terms of things that you're particularly proud of or things that you reflected on that you think you might have done better, have you got any lessons that you could share with us? Sure. Uh, you know, we, we really struggled with the balance between being out in front and being subject to guidance coming in posthumously to our decisions and having that guidance conflict what we were trying to be out in front on and making conservative decisions based upon guidance, based upon instructions from government leaders and really being as real time with that as we could. Uh, in hindsight, I would have let us get much further out in front. Uh, I, you know, my natural inclination was to hold us back a bit so that we, one, didn't overreact um, and deploy resources too quickly, uh, but also so that we didn't present ourselves into a litigious, potentially, environment of doing something that was later crossed with what your government mandate was. Uh, and going back to March, didn't know where the world was going, uh, had no idea, uh, but in hindsight, I would have let us run just as far and as fast as we could have uh, without that regulator. And that regulator was me. Then that was, that's my lesson yeah. uh, in this whole process. So. And, it, and it is interesting because, uh, again, and this cuts to both, you know, culture and location because, you know, the U.S. is the most litigious society on the face of the planet. And so some of the things that we would think to do here in Australia without a second thought in America has a whole list of different stakeholders that you will need to consider lest, lest you do in fact get sued. Um, we've been very fortunate here in Australia that the, because of the, uh, the stopping of international flights in from China and Iran, other hotspots, and then basically the quarantining of everything, um, was progressive from middle of February and then really in the middle of March pretty much really shut down hard and so we've had less I think I think we're still less than 100 deaths in Australia um, and Congratulations. just under 7,000 cases um, so extraordinary um, and I think we're now in that situation where uh, state governments will as a progressively relaxed uh, the states of emergency that have been called and the various restrictions, 
there's an expectation that there'll be clusters that will break out, but they'll be dealt with on a clustered basis. So, that, you know, this, I guess, augurs well, but our, our economy has um, collapsed, for lack of a better word. So, you, you know, you would, you would know, Mike, there's, you know, there's only 25 million of us here. There's about 13 or 14 million people employed. And in the month of April, we've now got heading towards 6 million people on government subsidies to either stay employed and another 1.7 million people who are in fact unemployed and entirely dependent on, the, on, on government subsidy for that. So, you know, there's, if you looked at a graph of employment changes over the last 20 years, you know, there's a spike in the mid eighties, a spike in the mid nineties, and it's shot off the top of the page in one month here now. It's, it's staggering stuff. So we think that the economic wreckage, um, which is at this point really just, it's just starting to bubble along. You know, we're seeing, we've seen the rise in unemployment. We've seen consumer sentiment drop off a cliff. We've seen bank lending drop off a cliff. We've seen house sales to be listed drop off a cliff. We've seen transactions drop off a cliff. Um, it will still take some months as the economic lag kicks in before we really start to see the, ap the actual damage to our economies and to our housing markets in particular. But one of the things that I think we can pr project is with the complete destruction of the Airbnb market, the complete absence now of international tourists, the large absence of internal tourism, the short-term accommodation market has collapsed. Most of those properties are now being put out on the rental market. We've gone literally overnight in, in Melbourne and Sydney from about under 2% vacancy rates to 10% vacancy rates and growing. So actually in the houselessness part of the market, in the lack of affordable housing part of the market, perversely, I think we're gonna see some very positive movements for people on low incomes. Perversely, equally, there's gonna be a lot more people on very low incomes. What mm -hmm. I don't know. Have you got any sense of, of and how that, the, the economic activity is, is likely to reverberate around in your communities, in particular in the housing stock that you've got? Sure. So uh, we, we early on uh, began to reach out to our residents on an individualized basis uh, and figure out what their situations were, uh, make sure they were aware of the assistance that was being provided. Uh, one thing that, that uh, I think we as a country have done fairly well this time is responded quickly on the fiscal stimulus side. Uh, in, in previous downturns, contractions, uh, nothing of this magnitude, of course, uh, the response has been very slow, and I think that has prolonged the damage. Uh, so similar, you know, we have a, a workforce in the United States of 160 million plus or minus so participation. Uh, I think as of this week, we are projected to hit 36 million plus that have been impacted directly uh, by the pandemic that have lost their employment. Uh, now, Fortunately, there are resources available to, the, available to them, not only provided at the federal level, passed through to the states, uh, but fortunately we work in jurisdictions where, uh, like the city I live in, Louisville, uh, they put together a, a $4 million plus in growing assistance fund for residents. And that's all, not only seeded by the city, I think by the tune of about two million, two and a half million, but now private philanthropists are, are donating in to provide assistance for uh, individuals who need assistance with rent, food, uh, medicines, various things. The other thing that's a little unspoken uh, in the States, um, it's known, but it's not talked about broadly, is that when you lose your employment, very often you lose your health care. Yeah. So not only in a time of great crisis, particularly a health crisis, do we have folks who are losing their income, they're losing access to health care at the same time. And I don't think we've seen the repercussions of that yet. Uh, that's going to have a long tail to it because in no way have we gotten anywhere near to the end of this, uh, in my estimation. So we'll be dealing with this for a while, particularly on the health side. And that loss of health care, that loss of coverage uh, is going to have a real dramatic effect. People will, we will lose people because they don't have access to health care. Um, yeah. And, and Mike, I, you know, my heart goes out to, to everybody in America in that situation. It's something we're very conscious of here in Australia, that 
when people lose their job, they lose their health, their, their health insurance in, in the States most, most usually. And, you know, and the costs of healthcare provision in the United States, of course, uh, is, is staggering, notwithstanding the fact that um, the average, I did some work, I, did, I, had a, I had a quick look at this when we were in the IHP in, uh, in Ottawa. You know, we were trying to get some sense of how different jurisdictions spent money in different areas. And the international comparison in the OECD that, that each government spends for medical care in Australia, well, the OECD average is about 4,000. Australia is close to 4,000. New Zealand is right on 4,000. The UK, for all of their bluster about the expense of NHS, is actually just a little bit over 4,000. We're measuring this in US dollars. And the US, which gets such a shocking reputation for healthcare for its citizens, actually spends 11,000 per citizen. So it, there is no relationship between the money that is spent and the outcome, sadly. And uh, it's a very difficult situation, particularly, I guess, for those people where you've got medically compromised people in your housing. And if they've not got that kind of assistance, um, yeah, you're right. This is going to have a very long tail. I think the, the other thing, Mike, is that you, you would know, and I think most thinking people have already worked out that RNA viruses, there are some vaccines, coronavirus is in the family of RNA viruses, but no coronavirus has ever had a successful vaccine. So, you know, this thing is subject to a vaccine, which seems unlikely. You're gonna bounce around back and forth, I think for certainly the rest of our working careers. And, and so we're, we're all gonna to have to think about how we change and modify our work practice and our workplace, and indeed even aspects of our private lives, I think. With um, with R&D, Mike, and you'd remember how, uh, the, the term that we use with R&D, rip off and duplicate. Um, so we are and doing some of the Cashman and Wakefield stuff that Jim Steele sent our way and um, amongst other sources about how we're going to, you know, rejig our workplaces. But I assume you, you guys too will be having to rethink how you manage your buildings and, and your workplace as well. Yeah, continuously, uh, we, you know, as, as we've gotten the guidance and technically we could have opened a little more this week, uh, but we're given another week. Um, you know, we are, we are looking to the medical profession. Um, there are virtual waiting areas now, which is sitting in your car in the parking lot. We think we can implement some of those measures within our, our communities. Uh, we had a really tough time with one exception uh, getting PPE. We had a certain amount of PPE on hand for necessary functions. You know, of course, the N95 masks are good for handling certain materials and chemicals. So we had a few. Uh, we in the States, we live in a just-in-time environment normally. So if we need something, we can have it shipped just about anywhere within about 24 hours. And inventory on the shelf is money, not in the bank. So that whole way of thinking on a go forward basis, we're gonna to have to think about that differently. We, we burned through our PPE stock that we had on hand within a few days, and we were not able to replenish that for nearly three weeks. Um, we, were, we were literally in a competitive bidding environment with states, nations. I mean, we, we just, there was no way that we could compete. Uh, we've since recovered from that and been able to just broadly distribute PPE. Um, one, the one exception was hand sanitizer, uh, so our bourbon distilleries were, were able to convert very quickly into producing hand sanitizer, uh, so we were able to get that fairly quickly, but everything else we, we were not able to get, so for, so, for a while. So does this mean you can get Jack Daniels or Jim Beam hand sanitizer? Well, this is actually uh, Sazerac uh, hand sanitizer. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. Uh, produced right here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, yes, and so, so we were able to get this very quickly. Uh, thanks to our state government taking an initiative, taking a lead, uh, really uh, helping the distilleries and the distilleries stepping in and, and converting their production. So sorry to uh, uh, the rest of the world who enjoys bourbon. There will be a gap in about seven years. Uh, <laughs> all right, just be ready for it. So. So I'm going to start stockpiling uh, Kentucky bourbon now. Can I say I am a firm uh, convert to Kentucky bourbon as a result of a, a, a wee bottle that you brought over with you when you were our thinker in residence. And as I recollect, that bottle didn't survive the evening. But anyway, um, so Mike, one of the other things, and, and I'm conscious we're going to have to wind up because we're going to try and keep these things at 40 minutes and Sue Masters will, will start sending me texts and she may just shut us down. Um, one of the one of the things that uh, 
that I became aware of recently is, uh, you know, the Republic, the United States of America, it's a Republic. You don't have knights and dames and all these sorts of awards. Um, and even in Australia, nor do we either, but um, we, we uh, Geraldine is a, a member, of, she's a, has an OBE and is a very esteemed member of, of her community as a result. I've been fortunate to be awarded an AM, but, but in, in America, you do things a little bit differently. And Josh, I think, who is uh, moderating this, is about to put a photo up, I think, of... Now, Mike, is that you? And is that the office of the mayor in Louisville proclaiming that March the 1st is now to be known as Mike Hines Day in Louisville? It is, yes. Uh, I, was, I was given the high honor uh, by our, still our current mayor, Greg Fisher, uh, of having a day uh, named for me. Mar it's March 1 of 2018. Uh, it, uh, it, it hangs in my office to this day. Uh, and uh, I was very appreciative uh, of that, that award and that honor. Um, it, uh, it really meant a lot. Um, and, and I imagine it would, because that is, that is a very significant thing in the Republic. So, so Mike, on that note, as a, as a leader in, in your field, in, in, well, in our field and in your geography, um, I wish you well managing those five states and those 10,000 units and all those vulnerable people that, uh, that you have charge and care of. Um, and we'll be in touch as we go along. But thank, thanks so much for, um, for taking the time out of your evening um to uh to spend some time with us to talk about a little bit about what life under lockdown lockdown looks like in kentucky and uh, i look forward to getting over there sometime mike and seeing that bluegrass you keep telling me about you'll, you'll have to come ken and, and i really appreciate uh, the opportunity i appreciate the the conversation and uh and it's good to see you as always i have uh, missed seeing you in the past couple of years Ditto, so. nice to talk to you see you soon okay. all right see you bye now